In approaching this subject of the biblical example of the corporate life of the Church and the Kingdom of God after Pentecost, I have chosen to establish two truths that are related, in my view, and necessary for those seeking the Kingdom of God and its righteousness. Now, as always, we have nothing to say to those who are not thus disposed. In my ministry, which has spanned 37 years and reached many peoples, I have no other goal or calling than to teach the Word of God contextually and exhaustively. I teach it as the infallible, inerrant, and inspired Word of the living God, and I teach it as the only guide, the only guide, to the faith and practice of the Church. As a prophet of the Lord, I'm not called to social or political reformation, and I'm not an ambassador for any nation, any ethnic group. I'm a spokesman for the Kingdom of God in this world, which came in its present form at Pentecost 2,000 years ago, and which owns no allegiance to sectarian or humanistic creeds, philosophies, or societies. I do not care what the enemies of the cross, the emissaries of the beast of religion, and the false prophets of this world think of my teaching. As for popularity, I can do without it. As for the praises of men, I do not need it. I own one Lord, Jesus Christ, the head of the Church, and I am seeking one and only one goal, that my service will be found acceptable in that day of Christ to him according to his instruction and calling. Now, if you're not seeking the kingdom of God and its righteousness, if you're not interested in knowing the will of God for your life as a born-again citizen of the heavenly realm and reign, if you're looking for an apologist for your carnal ambitions, beliefs, and possessions, then, my friend, you are tuned to the wrong person. And if that's true of you, whether or not you admit it, then you may as well turn this program off right now because you are not going to like what you are going to hear today. Today I promise to show you from simple and brief but accurate, clear and unassailable writings that neither Thomas Jefferson nor Benjamin Franklin was a Christian. Neither of them had a Christian government in mind and that the revolution was not allowed by the Bible. Furthermore, that the revolutionary movement did not establish a Christian nation, and that from a biblical-based point of view, a Christian nation in this present world is an absolute impossibility. I say from a biblical point of view, a Christian nation in this present world is an absolute impossibility. Now you may think that this is strange. Well, I'll tell you what is strange. It is strange that any prophet of the Lord should have to remind the church of this simple, plain, and age-long truth that every born-again believer should know. It is even possible, in my mind, that every person has to know and accept this to be a born-again believer. If he's not giving up on the fallen world of the first Adam, is there any repentance and desire for conversion in the true biblical sense? Now, this was certainly true of the church in the days of Thomas Jefferson. He was openly accused by the church of his day of being an infidel because of his frontal attacks on Jesus Christ, the Bible, the holy men who wrote the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and the Christian church in general. Now, better than telling you about it, let me give you Jefferson's own words. This is from a letter written from Washington 
April 21st, 1803, by Thomas Jefferson to Dr. Benjamin Rush. Jefferson wrote, and I'm quoting, The Christian religion was sometimes our topic, and I promised you then that one day or another I would give you my views on it. They are the result of a life of inquiry and reflection, and very different from the anti-Christian system imputed to me by those who know nothing of my opinion. To the corruptions of Christianity I am indeed opposed, but not to the genuine precepts of Jesus himself. I am a Christian in the only sense in which he wished anyone to be, sincerely attached to his doctrines in preference to all others, ascribing to himself all human excellence, and believing he never claimed any other. Now, human is italicized as well as the work he. He was only human. He never claimed anything else. In other words, Jefferson was underscoring his belief as a Unitarian and a deist that Jesus was only human, that he never claimed anything else, that his followers made up other claims for him. Now, in this passage, Jefferson acknowledges that the Christian world considered him an anti-Christian person in his theological system. He said that. Not the anti-Christian system that is often attributed to me by the Christians, he said. The corruptions of Christianity to which Jefferson referred were the virgin birth, the incarnation of God in the person of Jesus Christ, the resurrection, the new birth, and other extra-natural and extra-human dogmas. Jefferson, as we shall see, was disparaging of those beliefs. Later in the same letter, regarding his thoughts on the comparative merits of Jesus to Socrates, he said, And in confiding to you, I know it will not be exposed to the malignant perversions of those who make every word from me a text for new misrepresentations and calumnies. I am moreover averse to communication of my religious tenets to the public because it would countenance the presumption of those who have endeavored to draw them before that tribunal and to seduce public opinion to erect itself into the inquisition over the rights of conscience for himself, which the laws have so justly prescribed. Here Jefferson confirms again the strong opposition he was getting from the Christian community for his humanistic non-Christian views. He also told Dr. Rush in this quotation that he did not feel the Christian community had any right to examine his views and to judge him non-Christian because of them. In other words, in the views of Jefferson, anyone in government or society at large ought to have the right to hold any belief he wanted to, and no one should have the right to question it. This is what the laws that he had helped make, that man is a sovereign individual having the right to complete autonomy and self-government, this is what the laws that he had helped make were trying to defend. And indeed, that is true. The revolutionary government of Jefferson and Franklin believed in complete autonomy, not only from the church, but from Jesus Christ, who was only one of the great philosophers, who was not divine, and from the Bible, which was mostly the work of heretical and fanatical followers of Jesus, and of whom he would have disapproved, and also insulation from public opinion. He did believe, or profess to believe, in the internal guidance of natural law. But this was undefined and undefinable, except to the individual in Jefferson's mind. Now Franklin, as we shall see, thought a bit more of a consensus could be achieved by society, but was fully in agreement that the Bible and Jesus Christ, the dead human originator of the sect of Christianity, should have little or nothing to do with it. If Thomas Jefferson were alive today, he would defend abortion as the natural right of a woman 
and denounced those Christian bigots who sought to impose their convictions on her. Now, I'm not saying that that's right or good or that I agree with it. I'm simply saying that this is what Jefferson would be doing. He would lead the charge against prayer in school. He would be in the vanguard of those defending homosexual and lesbian rights. Of course, I do not believe they have any rights, as you know, if you listen to me, but Jefferson did. And he would denounce as malignant perverts those who sought to discover, to expose, and to hold in contempt the personal and private behavior of President Clinton. This and nothing other is what Jefferson is telling Dr. Rush. Quote, It behooves him to, in his own case, to give no example of concession, betraying the common right of independent opinion by answering questions of faith which the laws have left between God and himself long before Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton were stonewalling it. Thomas Jefferson was advocating it. Every man is a God unto himself, said Jefferson. That's what Jesus was really teaching. A man has the right to his own opinions in everything, and no one has any right to question him for his beliefs or his practices. Now, this doesn't mean that Jefferson did not believe in the rule of law, although, like Socrates, it appeared that it was contrary to natural autonomy. And those laws should not include man's religious beliefs and practices, nor should the law look closely at his moral makeup. Now, but Jefferson is not done with Rush. Quote, In a comparative view of the ethics of the enlightened nations of antiquity, of the Jews and of Jesus, no notice should be taken of the corruptions of reason among the ancients, to wit, idolatry and superstition of the vulgar, nor the corruptions of Christianity by learned professors, by learned among its professors. Let a just view be taken of the moral principles inculcated by the most esteemed of the sects of ancient philosophy to their individuals, particularly Pythagoras, Socrates, Epicurus, Cicero, Epictetus, Seneca, and Antonius. Here Jefferson continues to caution the good doctor to consider Jesus and Judaism in the same natural light as any human philosophy or philosopher. Ignore the superstitious and the idolatrous claims that Jesus rose from the dead, that he is God, and that we are to worship and follow this dead man. This vulgar doctrine, he says, is beneath reasoning men. He continues in his comparison. In this state of things among the Jews, Jesus appeared. His parentage was obscure. He liked Thomas, and I'm inserting here, he liked Franklin, believed that Jesus was a bastard in the story. His virgin birth was made up to uh, obscure turpitude. His parentage was obscure, his condition poor, his education null, his natural endowments great, his life correct and innocent. The disadvantages under which his doctrine appeared are remarkable. Like Socrates, he wrote nothing of himself, but he had not, like them, a Xenophon or an Arian to write for him. On the contrary, all the learned of his country, entrenched in its power and riches, were opposed to him, lest his labors should undermine their advantage. And the committing to writing his life and doctrines fell on unlearned and ignorant men who wrote, to, from memory, and not till long after the transaction had passed. He fell an early victim, about thirty years of age, his reason having not yet attained the maximum of its energy, nor his cor the course of his preaching, which was but three years at the most, presented occasion of developing a complete system of morals. Hence his doctrine, which he really delivered, were defective as a whole, and fragments of what he did believe and deliver have come to us as mutilated, misstated, and often unintelligible 
the question of his being a member of the Godhead or indirect in indirect communication with it, claimed by some of his followers and denied by others, is foreign to the present view. So Jesus didn't live long enough to develop a, a complete doctrine. And what he did teach, we don't know, because his poor followers, not like uh, Arius, who was the father of, of the, the, the doctrine that Thomas Jefferson believed, Unitarianism, he didn't have good writers to put his views down. These were ignorant men. Their memory was poor. They wrote long after the fact. They misstated many things. They mutilated many things. And many things like Jesus telling them to eat his flesh and drink his blood, or Jesus telling them before Abraham I was. Many of them are unintelligible. They can't even be read and understood. And there's absolutely no thought here, no room here whatsoever for this ridiculous claim that he never made, but his followers did, that he was part of the Godhead and while he was here in direct communication with God. So said Benjamin Franklin to Dr. Rush. To Dr. Benjamin Waterhouse, he wrote from Monticello on June 26, 1802, the doctrines of Jesus are simple and tend all to the happiness of man. Number one, there is only one God. Number two, that there is a future state of rewards and punishment. And number three, that to love God with all thy heart and thy neighbor as thyself is the sum of religion. These are the great points in which he endeavored to reform the religion of the Jews. But compare these with the demoralizing dogmas of Calvin. Number one, there are three gods. Number two, the good works or the love of thy neighbor are nothing. Number three, that faith is everything, and that the more incomprehensible the proposition, the more merits in his faith. Number four, that reason in religion is of unlawful use. Number five, that God from the beginning elected certain individuals to be saved and certain others to be damned, and that no crimes of the former condemn them, no virtue, virtues of the latter save them. And Franklin continues, or Jefferson continues, now which of these is the true and charitable Christian? He who believes the acts on the simple teachings of Jesus or the impious dogmas of Athanasius and Calvin. These are the false shepherds. Now, he's talking about Athanasius and Calvin here. These are the false shepherds foretold to enter in, not by the door of the sheepfold, but to climb up some other way. They are mere usurpers of the name of Christian, teaching counter-religion made up of the deliria of crazy imaginations. Why does Jefferson here link Athanasius with Calvin? Well, the reason is twofold. In the Reformed Congregationalist climate of the late 1970s, the Calvinism of the Puritans and others was synonymous with Christianity as it was being expressed in Jefferson's mind. The Manifest Destiny Doctrine that justified the taking of the land from the natives was based on the biblical concept of sovereignty, although, of course, it was indeed defective. But the real enemy of the Unitarian and his founder, Arius, was Athanasius, who had instigated the renouncing of Arius as a heretic for his teaching that Jesus was not God, that he was not divine, that he did not rise from the dead, and that the only benefit of his teaching were moral and that nothing has to do with a personal relationship with him or with God. This was on the, the grounds on which Arius was denounced. Jefferson, a thoroughgoing Unitarian, felt that his own dilemma with the Christians of his day was in part due to Arius. And in case you think that this is unwarranted interpretation, listen to Jefferson's own words later in this letter to Waterhouse. Quote, I rejoice that in this blessed country of free inquiry and belief, which has surrendered its creeds and conscience to neither king nor priest, the genuine doctrine of the one and only God receiving, and I trust that there is not a young man now living in the United States who will not die 
a Unitarian. And remember, the Unitarians do not believe in the virgin birth, the incarnation, the resurrection, the ascension, the second coming. They don't believe in the efficacy of the cross. Jesus was nothing more than one of the philosophers of history and a young man who was not nearly as developed as some of the others. This is the Unitarian belief. Thomas Jefferson will that every young man living in the United States dies a Unitarian. And this, of course, Jefferson was willing all of their souls to hell. He then commends the wisdom of the Quakers for accepting neither the virgin birth, the resurrection, the ascension, or the giving of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, or any of other what he calls mysteries. And the accuracy of this uh, commendation of the Quakers I cannot attest to because I haven't studied it out. He commends them and he concludes by saying, Be this the wisdom of the Unitarians, this holy mantle, which shall cover within its charitable circumference all who believe in one God and all who love their neighbors. I conclude my sermon. That was Jefferson who said that, not me. You're going to have to wait a few minutes for that. You want to talk about uh, ecumenism, one world religion? Thomas Jefferson wanted to talk about it and did. Thus we see that Jefferson, the Unitarian, who did not believe in the virgin birth, the resurrection, or the incarnation of God in the person of Jesus, considered not only Calvin, but Athanasius and Orthodox Christianity to be the damnable doctrines of false shepherds and evil workers. In a presidential letter dated August 10, 1787, the recipient of which I do not know at the present, Jefferson Council, question with boldness even the existence of God, because if there be one, he must more approve of the homage of reason than that of blindfolded fear near Jefferson. Now here, in an expression of contempt for the faith of the Bible, and in an appeal to the cult of reason, Jefferson opens the question of the existence of God to be resolved not by faith or by the word of God, but by reason. As at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, nothing is to be determined by revelation from God through the Bible. Everything is owing to the facility of human reason. Now this, my friends, in case you've been missing it, is humanism in its purest form and has nothing at all in common with the Orthodox Christian faith. Nothing at all. It's at opposite poles. To his grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter dated 24 November 1808, quote, In the fevered state of our country, no good can ever result from any attempt to set one of these fiery zealots to rights, either in the fact or principle. They are determined as to the facts they will believe and the opinions on which they will act. Get by them, therefore, as you would by an angry bull. It's not for a man of sense to dispute with the road with such an animal. I take it he means in the road. So Jefferson is saying that the fanatics against whom he's warning his grandson were Athanasius, the writers of the New Testament, the Bible itself, and the professing Christian church of today. They're narrow, they're bigoted, they're not going to change, and so just get around them the best way you can. In a 1777 copy of Jefferson's proposal for a Bill of Rights for Virginia, which was rejected as being too extreme, too humanist, too anti-Christian, by the way. Jefferson wrote, in opposition to the dogmas of the church and the leaders who held them, quote, well aware of the opinions and beliefs of men depend not on their own will, but follow involuntarily the evidence proposed to their minds. That Almighty God hath created the mind free 
and manifested the supreme will that it shall remain free by making it altogether unsusceptible to restraint, that all attempts to influence it by temporal punishments, by burthens, or by simple civil incapacitations tend only to beget habits of hypocrisy and meanness and are a departure from the holy author of our religion, who being Lord both of the body and the mind, yet chose not to propagate it by coercion on either, as was his almighty power to do, but to extend it by the influence of reason alone. Jefferson continues his petty tirade against the church in this uh, draft and those who seek to instill piety in their people by biblically prescribed teachings pressures and disciplines. We're not going to go into that. The point I wish to establish by this final quotation is to show clearly Jefferson's concept of government. It was anything but Christian. Like all humanists, Jefferson butchers the truth. God never chose to impose control over man's thoughts, he said. But then, of course, Jefferson goes to Epicurus and not to the early chapters of Genesis to establish his religious philosophy. God's instruction to Adam concerning the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are some of the corruptions of God's mind by the writers of the Bible, according to Jefferson. God never told Eve to stay away from the tree of reason, science, and experience. Jesus never said, except a man deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. That was written by some ignorant, dull-witted follower of Jesus whose memory had grown dull, and he was very vague as to what Jesus said. Anyone honestly looking at the opinions of Thomas Jefferson as he expressed himself, and there are hundreds of them, these are just a few, and concluding that Jefferson was a Christian, is either a liar or a fool, or both. This exercise of establishing the religion of Jefferson and Franklin and the religious philosophy of governing America, the ambitions of its founders, and what it had in terms of exhibiting a Christian form and following Christian ways, the question of whether or not any nation in this world could have been, is, or could ever be Christian has turned into more of an exercise than I thought at first. But I shall see it through now that it has started. Next time we will look into the expressed views of Benjamin Franklin to see if he professed to be a follower of Christ. In a few weeks, perhaps, two or three, we will wind up this prelude. It really is about the second chapter of Acts and the functioning of the early church, as you will see in time. <laughs> You've been listening to God's Point of View, an interdenominational expository teaching of the Bible in the historic Orthodox tradition of the Christian Church. For Earl and the staff at God's Point of View, this is Daryl Peavy inviting you to join us tomorrow at the same time. Goodbye for now, and go with God. Music